Hey everyone, it's the Kung Fu Genius, aka Alex Richter. And if you're listening to us on audio only, I'd appreciate you rating and reviewing the podcast wherever you listen to it. And of course, if you like what I do here, don't forget to subscribe to the Kung Fu Genius on YouTube and hit that bell for notifications. Are you a fan of Wing Chun Kung Fu? Well, if you listen to me, I assume you are. I got great news for Kung Fu Genius fans. Right now, you can get an all access one month free trial subscription to Wing Chun Illustrated Magazine. Yes, I said free. Go to wcinewsstand.com and register in the upper right hand corner fill in your email and password and use the code kfg trial to get your free trial to the issues from 2011 to the current issue that's right all the issues even the one with this guy on the cover my kung fu genius column is in all the new issues as if you need another reason to get this awesome magazine go get your free trial subscription today for all that information check out the description below and with that let's get started all right, peeps, on today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius will be answering all sorts of hot nonsense from YouTube. Lots of gems, lots of warring with Learn Ting, lots of, excuse me, Mr. Van Dam. maybe next time. Let's get to it. He is unstoppable, unbeatable, unbelievable. He's Alex Richter, the Kung Fu Genius. And every day, I practice martial arts. <laughs> Watch out. Word is, I'm a Kung Fu Genius. Practiced all day like a genius. Practiced all day like a genius. Yo, Dre, how you doing, man? Oh, Sifu, I'm Gucci. Yeah, so here we are in the second episode of our second year, our new season. Wow. So super excited about that. Wow. We got another AMA, Ask Me Anything, not an MMA. <laughs> Uh, we got an AMA today. Are you sure about that? Because you say MMA a lot. Hey, 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 hey. Hey. Take it easy. (laughs) All right. Okay, so uh, let's get to it. What you got for me? Let's get right into it. All right. First up, off the back, straight out the gate, we got G Buck 101. G Buck? G Buck. Uh huh. G Buck. He's from the G unit. Uh-huh. G Buck. It's not G B U K or is it? Like he's I not think from the it's UK. G B U K. Oh, okay. But you call him G Buck. <laughs> it's, it's all like about a, getting those G Bucks. Yeah, it's like Lil Wayne's manager. I love Bucks. G Buck. I lo- <laughs> Drives a G Wagon. <laughs> G Wagon, G Wagon, G. All right. Great episode. I love when he said it all. I love like when the they say that because yeah. I never know what episode I, they're talking neither, about, right? Me neither, but we, we know it's one of them. It's one of them. One good, of the good. 52. Well, we, we take whatever compliment we can get. <laughs> Right. Let's, let's, let's be optimistic. Maybe it's all of them. Let's just go with that. Yes. Yes. Damn. Yeah. That's very optimistic. Man. That is very optimistic. Great episode. Awesome. I'll take really it. Really liked the story about your Chinese name. Damn, that's dope, man. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, White Haw. <laughs> now In, we know which episode it is. Yeah, now we know which episode <laughs> it is. In that story, you mentioned having a war with Leung Ting. What is the story behind that war? Wow. Uh, well, right from the beginning, we're yeah. not even getting warm Out the today. Gate. Let's just go straight into yeah. like political into nonsense. the lava. So uh, let's jump right in it. Well, well, I actually talked about this on an episode of Dudes of Kung Fu a long time ago. So this is this is old news. This is from 2016, and it is <laughs> essentially the origin story of the Kung Fu Genius nickname. You know, for all those people out there, well, he doesn't sound like a Kung Fu genius. Yeah, right? kind of, uh, as I explained <laughs> about two episodes ago, it's 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 kind of a joke, guys. Take it easy, all right? Uh, so anyway, but I like it. KFG, Kung Fu genius, it's a, mm-hmm. it's a fun nickname, it's right? It's catchy. It's catchy, right? Has a, has a ring, has yeah, a flow. absolutely. Rolls plus right a, off the Plus tongue. I have a rap song now, so I have to you use it, it yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, After you, Kess the MC wrote yeah. the, the, the rap song, Kung Fu genius, mm-hmm. uh, uh, there's no turning back now. I heard uh, you had to come out on stage when you was performing it recently. What? This sounds like fake at news. At Marquee. What are, you, what are you talking about? You was performing at Marquee. I, will, I never go to clubs. What are you talking about? <laughs> giving people the wrong impression Cass of me, was right? on stage. It absolutely happened. I was there. Yeah, I was, wow. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I wanted to be there. I All wanted right. to be there, but I had to go straight home. And Got it. So, uh, yeah, so I mentioned kind of briefly that I had like a bit of a war, a bit of a back and forth with Sifu Larrington and Apple mm. Daily. That was 2016. And uh, that kind of became the genesis of the Kung Fu Genius nickname. And for like longtime listeners who heard about it on Dudes of Kung Fu, I, I apologize. It's kind of an old story. Um, and I think when I actually talked about it on Dudes of Kung Fu, like when it happened, I was a little bit more uh, emotional about it because Ooh, it, yeah. it had just kind of happened. And now we are looking at it like some, you know, six years later. 
so I, I can look at it it's with good a little math. bit more perspective. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm not the math genius, but I can figure out six years. So uh, <laughs> You didn't even need the fingers. No, I didn't no. even need the fingers, no, right? No. I was doing it in my head. I was using <laughs> counters in my head, right? So uh, basically what happened is so uh, Apple Daily, which is a Hong Kong newspaper, they're now defunct because... No China- relation to Apple... Apple bottom jeans, no, no relation. To Apple bottom jeans, uh, love, but Apple Daily, jeans. Apple Daily is uh, now a defunct magazine because um, defunct because they they were like one of the big tabloid newspapers <clears throat> right. of Hong Kong, so something a little bit more, let's say, like uh, the New York Post type thing. So a little bit, it's like gossipy, sensationalist news. And uh, yeah. China now has cracked down on on newspapers that don't say nice things about China. Mm-hmm. So Apple so Daily supermarket news. Is, so Apple Daily go bye bye. Oh uh, no! Because you know, big Big Brother China didn't like some things <laughs> that were said about you know. Well, it's Ooh. just strange, you know. Big Big Brother China is so strong and so powerful, but don't say anything bad about them because they will shut you down. It's not really a point of strength, in my opinion. Uh, if you can't handle people saying things about you, so. But anyway, I digest or digress. Uh, I was in Apple Daily, and one of the reporters there from uh, Apple Daily is a good friend of mine. He's here in New York. They had a New York office, and oh, that's uh, cool. I'd been in Apple Daily before. Every now and again, they you know they would do like a puff piece, even though they're a bit of a gossipy newspaper. But they would also just do like puff pieces, like "Hey, look at this white guy who teaches kung fu in New York. Isn't that funny, right?" And also at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, I was interviewed for Apple Daily. That was a video interview mm. uh, right at the beginning when we started teaching on Zoom and everything like that. So there, there's like a video of me talking about how we had pivoted to do all like the online oh, classes right. and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, and as of last year. Uh, very I, innovative in that. In that yeah, I, uh, yeah, I mean, now everyone is doing it, but <laughs> I, I think I was one of the first to yeah. kind of jump on that. Yeah. Um, and so uh, this was around 2016. They interviewed me. I don't even think there was a video interview. I think it was just a, like a regular text article, like, you know, just a normal newspaper article. And, hmm. uh, you know, they came here and they interviewed me and uh, talked about how I've you know, been teaching Wing Chun for many years and so on and so forth. And oddly enough, the thing that started the whole, I'm not going to say war because it was just kind of a back and forth and I, I won very easily, so it's not much of a war, um, was, was the one offhanded comment that I said in the article. And what's interesting is, and I can see it like in our YouTube comments, because every now and again we'll do a, uh, you know, we'll, we'll we'll pick a topic that people get a little pissy about, like Dim Mac or something like that. And there are like a couple, pe- there are a couple yeah. people in the comments yeah. that get so triggered and have to just have like this verbal diarrhea, which I'll never read, by the way. And it's just funny, like you can see what is the point that gets them upset or mindfulness yeah right or something like that right yeah and uh, uh yeah oddly enough oddly enough it's always those like peaceful topics of like the 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 use of mindfulness in martial arts or the effectiveness of tai chi or, it's always these things that are kind of like soft and yielding that trigger people the most oh, you know man. what i mean it's very funny all right doughiness they're very, very much unlike the topics they are uh, espousing to uh to, to push in their martial arts they're very undaoist when they get upset like uh-huh. that. so so anyway um one of the questions was what is the difference what do what did i feel was the difference between uh let's say chinese sifus and western sifus right and so i um i wrote that well for the most part a lot of Chinese sifus don't view themselves as a service provider. And those were the, like, service provider were the exact words, right? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, they view themselves more as, like, a kind of a keeper of the gate. And almost you have to, like, jump through all these hoops to be able to learn all this stuff behind the gate that they're guarding, right? Uh, Whereas in a more Western sense, if someone comes to your school... Uh, yeah, maybe some people could say it's more transactional because they're paying you and it's business and people are like, oh, that's not the real uh, uh, heart of martial arts. I get it. But also if someone pays me to learn martial arts, then there's an expectation that I'm going to teach them and I'm going to try to do a good job and maybe even like give good customer service or something Mm -hmm. like that and maybe not yell and scold at my students or ignore them as is sometimes done in very traditional martial arts schools. But I said that as a very general statement. And as a matter of fact, when he asked me that, that the reference to that was not Sifu Leung Ting at all because to be fair to Sifu Leung Ting, which is not always easy to do, um, he's really not that way. If anyone understood that martial arts or Wing Chun could be run as a business, uh, he definitely understands that, right? And definitely understands to a certain degree 
that a martial arts instructor has to be some kind of a service provider, even if that doesn't necessarily fit in the very traditional Chinese model, right? Okay. But when, when the reporter asked me that question, that was a general statement. I was not actually talking or referencing Sifu Langting at all. I was just saying, you know, like, as you know, when you walk into some Chinese Kung Fu schools in Hong Kong, it's like... Uh, you walk in and no one looks at you and no one really cares. And then maybe you get uh, someone to talk to you. And then if you join, it's maybe not even that much better from when you first walked in, right? <laughs> so it's a very different vibe, right? And that's all I said. And that was like one question of a number of questions, right? Uh -huh. And then the article came out and I didn't think much of it. And then the reporter emails me a week later and he says, Sifu Lang Tang has written this scathing statement about me in Apple, like he wrote a, st a statement to Apple Daily, right? And, uh, what? and an email? And, no, a statement, like to them, like, you know, basically trying to refute the things that I said in the article, right? Which is very funny because that no. is the old school version of someone triggered in the comments. Mm. <laughs> like, yeah. like getting so upset. First of all, Siva Lang Teng, in my time with him, he was always he was always giving me the advice of, you know, if you have a problem with someone, you shouldn't you shouldn't draw attention to them right like by by going out and calling someone out or by causing an, a problem with this person like especially in public you're also giving that person more publicity right these were things that he taught me yeah but he always falls victim like he cannot follow his own advice he he's he's always kind of done this right and so there he is like now suddenly taking aim and the main thing he took aim at was the line about, I thought Chinese martial arts instructors don't view themselves as service providers, which ironically enough was not aimed at all towards him. Yeah. But the fact that he got triggered by that tells you something, mm -hmm. right? So maybe he feels, you know, that way and doesn't like being called out, but I was not calling him out. So he wrote this crazy statement saying something, well, actually he didn't write it. His assistant Robin wrote it, all right? Because uh. Sifu Langting, like he doesn't, he wants to call people out, but he never wants to do it himself. Mm. He always like, uh, he, he and he's even told this to me in emails, he, he calls these people around him useful idiots. So what he does is he writes this statement, but he has like Robin sign it. All right. So Robin left Rob Howard Stern and went to Lung No, Tang. not that Robin. Robin is his assistant in Hong Kong. All right. Okay. So Rob Robin. Robin is like his Dre. Okay. <laughs> all right. Nifka. Yeah. The only difference is I would if if I had something to say about someone, I wouldn't have I wouldn't write a statement and then have you sign it. Yeah. And and then you get the heat for it, right? You know what I mean? Like like that. But that's what Sifu Lion Ping does, right? Mm -hmm. So and the statement was that like I. Um, I had only learned Wing Chun for one week from Sifu Long Teng, like magically. All right, and uh, also, and he even said stuff that was so childish in the statement, like, "Who cares about his City Wing Chun Athletic Association?" He even wrote that, like, 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 who, who cares? Like who, like, which is like, well, thanks for spelling the name of my association yeah. in your statement, <laughs> right? You know, like they say that no bad, there's no Get bad press. Publicity. Just make sure they, spe yeah. they, they spell your name right, right? <laughs> so he said all this stuff and it was really funny. And then the reporter asked me, he goes, do you have a counter to this statement? And I thought it was absolutely hysterical because first of all, I know what he's doing because he's told me this before. He, he seems to forget like, I've spent time with him. I've seen him use this tactic on other people. Yeah. And I've heard him explain what he's doing. And then he thinks I'm going to take the bait on this stuff. It's like, dude, you told me what you're doing and I see you doing it. And you right? told me what to do in this case. Exactly. Too. Right. And, and so what he's trying to do is he wants me to become defensive because when you become defensive, it looks like you're hiding something. Right. But the problem is that he did it in a very stupid way. Mm-hmm. Because Sifu Lang Ting doesn't really understand how the internet works, which I've explained when I had to order that hairspray thing for him or whatever. Like, he cannot even order something online. If you gave him a mobile phone and you were logged into your Amazon and you told him to order toilet tissue, he would not be able to do it, right? Okay. But he also doesn't understand how the internet works. Because when I left his association, which was 2011, mm -hmm. he sent an email to all of his instructors to remove any links on their website to mine. All right. Or remove any mention about Sifu Alex Richter on their websites. Right. And in his mind, he thinks that has erased me from the Internet. Mm -hmm. Like he thinks that yeah. his association doesn't mention me anymore. All right. Mm -hmm. 
uh, which he doesn't realize. Like, at last time I checked, it's actually a bunch of photos of me on their Hong Kong website, which they haven't gotten rid of, which is very funny. Um, so anyway, but he thinks that he thinks that oh, like God. he thinks that by telling all the instructors in the U.S. to remove any mention of me, he has literally scrubbed me from the internet because he doesn't understand how you. the internet works. Right? He doesn't understand first of all how many other websites outside of his association have referenced. The time I was in his association, the interviews and all the other things that we've done, right? And also the sheer number of photos and the time that I spent with him and everything like like it's ridiculous, right? Yeah. And so the reporter is like, "How do you want to respond to this, right?" And I just la I just laughed to him on the phone, you know. And then I wrote, I said, "Oh, I'll put this in an email." And I just I just laughed to him. I said, "Look, all right." Why would he say that I learned for one week? Why didn't he just say I learned for three days, right? Yeah. If I could learn all this Wing Chun for him in one week, then I'd be a Kung Fu genius. That was what I said. And they printed that in my in, in, in the article, right? In and the then after article. that, the reporter said, hey, Kung Fu Genius, we put that in there for you. <laughs> and then uh, and then a couple of my friends in Hong Kong saw it and said, hey, Kung Fu Genius, it was really funny what you wrote there. Right. And then I said it like, you know, because so. Kung Fu Genius, first of all, it's the name of an old Kung Fu movie, but yeah. Kung Fu Tin Choi is a, is, a, is a saying for someone who's just like bestowed from head. Because in, in, in Chinese... When you translate Kung Fu genius, the term genius, if you look at the two characters, it almost mm. means like a talent from heaven. Mm. All right. And so it's a very lofty term. Like Bruce Lee is considered a Kung Fu genius. Or if you watch Kung Fu Hustle, Stephen Chow's character, yeah, he's a Kung Fu genius. Right? About they Stephen even call Chow. him that. Like, oh, he's got the bone yeah. structure of a Kung Fu genius. Right? right. So I use it as a joke. Like, oh, I must be a Kung Fu genius if I learned all that stuff in one week from him, right? And then after that, people had read it in Hong Kong and a bunch of my friends started calling me that as a joke mm -hmm. and then it just stuck, oh, right? Man. dope. You were sent from heaven. That's right. To do so, this podcast. So the thing is that it made him look really stupid yeah. because first of all, everyone knows I was his representative <laughs> for, for over nine years here in New York, right? And he came to New York every year, sometimes multiple times a year. I went to Hong Kong. I was impressed with him in Hungary. I'm in articles with him. I'm in his Chinese books. And there's just like, there's all this photo record of him and me learning from him for so many years. But he thinks Man. he can just say, oh, I only taught him for one week because he's um you know when people were like cool very early on in in their life and they can never let it go you know like someone who still has the same hairstyle they had when they were in high school because that's when they peaked in popularity right yeah well sifu lang ting his advantage over many of the other sifus in hong kong one of his advantages was that he had his own publishing company so he could publish books mm. and he can do all sorts of stuff that's, but he that's he, genius he used his books to a certain degree, is a bit of a propaganda machine against some of the people that he didn't like, especially like William Zhang or some other Wing Chun Sifus that he was not particularly fond of, right? Because maybe they didn't have books or they didn't have the reach that he did. So he could write these books and then he could have some things planted in those books that were kind of like little nuke bombs to his uh, opponents, right? Because first of all, there was no internet there. So if something was out in a book, it's in black and white, that's a big deal, right? So he still thinks that he can just say something, that thing will go out there and everyone's going to accept it because he controls the media. But he doesn't realize that after the internet, he doesn't control anything anymore. Mm. He, does, he cannot control his image anymore. He cannot control anything, right? But he still thinks he can say stuff like, oh, he only learned from me for one week because he thinks I've been scrubbed from the internet because he told his schools to take me off. He literally doesn't understand how this works. He doesn't understand how oh, this works. Man. So when that happened, I thought it was really funny. The article came out. My friends started calling me Kung Fu Genius. Yeah. And then that kind of became the, the birth of that, right? Like, but like then wildflyer. I, um, I got a little... Like, at first, I kind of laughed it off. I thought it was kind of funny. And then, like, and then I started to get pissed. I started to get really pissed off. Mm. Not because of him trying to make me look bad or whatever, but because he's done this to so many people. Mm. And I realized that um, I think I need to say something about that. Not not because he did it to me. Maybe him doing it to me was the catalyst to get me to speak about it. But I realized that he had done it to so many people. And at some point, like that someone... you know personally, yeah, too. Yeah, someone needs to call him out on this. So I wrote, I don't know if you remember, I wrote this epic long blog post. I also have a website, sifualexrichter.com, which I just use now for getting private students. But I used to have a blog on there. Mm -hmm. um, it was an 
epic long blog post with photos and all sorts of stuff, like really just like explaining the kind of history of these kind of things, right? And uh, I posted it on Facebook and uh, the thing got like 20,000 views. So he didn't realize, like no one read his stupid retort in Apple Daily, right? In fact, Damn. I think where he, he even kind of messed up because the, the Apple Daily article was in the Hong Kong one and he sent his statement to like the one in Taiwan, to like the Taiwan branch. So like he, he, like he, just, he just kept stepping on his own feet on this thing, like no. just really looking oh, like a no. straight clown, right? Oh, no. And so uh, I, I thought, well, you know what? He's done this to so many people. Like he, Sifu Leung Ting on one hand wants to boast that, you know, he has an organized teaching system and he has a structured ranking system. And that through that organized teaching system and ranking system, uh, he has a high level of quality and that there's some kind of consistent quality among all of his branches. And that if you're a such and such level or you're a Sifu under him or blah, 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 that that stands for a benchmark of quality, right? But the moment that person leaves his association or gets kicked out, suddenly that person sucked at Wing Chun, didn't know anything, was not really qualified, didn't really receive their ranks or whatever, right? And he did that consistently. And so it was kind of like, look, if some, if you have a big association and one of your top guys leaves, yeah, you're not going to go and sing that person's praises maybe if they go and start their own association. But to then go out of your way and start to say that person wasn't really qualified to begin with, mm. you, he doesn't realize he makes himself look bad. When mm. someone who is high ranked in his association, all right, and mind you, I was not super high ranked in his association. He's done this to people way higher and way more senior than me. Mm -hmm. And they left his association, most notably Sifu Cheng Chun Fun, who was like his partner since the 60s, all right? Sifu, Sifu Cheng was in all of his books, and Sifu Cheng was there. Sifu Cheng was literally his most loyal guy. Is this the guy, guy from that demo I like the, in, in your Sifu no, school? No, 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 no. no. Sifu Cheng is much more. That, that was Alan Fong. Sifu Cheng gotcha. is much more senior than Alan gotcha. Fong. Gotcha. And so what does he do when, when Sifu Cheng does his own thing? He starts talking all sorts of shit about him. I was there and heard him talk shit about him in Hong Kong and removes him from the books. You know, he does this kind of like very Orwellian 1984 thing where if, you know, they always joke the kiss of death with your relationship with Sifu Leung Ting is if you're on the, a cover of a book with him. <laughs> if you're ever on the cover of a book or the cover of a magazine with him, dollars to donuts, you will be kicked out or leave his association at some point. Oh, and then you know what Tip. he has, and then you know what he has to do. He has to change the cover again. <laughs> you know how you know how many he's changed the cover. He's he's, he's changed the cover of Dynamic Wing Chun so many times at this point. It's comical. The, the original cover had Tam Hong Fun on it. Oh God. Tam Hong Fun leaves. He's got to change it. He puts An Da Yi and yeah. Yuan Kai Guang on the cover. Uh -huh. They both leave. He's got to change the cover again. He puts Leung Kuo Wa on the cover. Oh, oh, at least he's got to change the cover again. All right. It's like, yo, just put yourself on the cover next time. All right. Although at some point I can imagine Sifu Leung Ting might quit his own association oh, no. and have to change the oh, cover. Right. No. So uh, he just be like, I'm done with this shit. All right. And then wow. he'll have to change the cover. Yeah, right. Yeah. So what I did is I wrote this epic long blog post where I basically, well, I, I, I defended my case a little bit because I, I was a little upset about that, that he had done it. Mm -hmm. So I decided, well, why don't I just kind of expose what he does to other people? Mm -hmm. And then I talked a little bit about it, like, you know, like him trying to disqualify people who left his association, right? All right, you and saying salty. Like, yeah. so, saying, oh, this person doesn't know anything. And then I brought up the fight quest thing. Right. Yes. Because, you know, for all of his like, oh, Alex, you know, suddenly. All right. I was his boy for, for a while when I was there. And yeah. then suddenly I'm not. And suddenly I only learned for one week. And then I, what I did is I just released a bunch of emails that he had sent me. And I said, oh, OK, well, funny. I only learned for one week because when when we were having fight quest and you needed an Asian fighter to fight Jimmy, mm -hmm. you couldn't find any in Hong Kong. And Robin, the guy who wrote the statement. He was too chicken to fight himself. He was too chicken. Aye, aye, aye. All right. So I, so I, I had to go and see if one of my Korean students back in New York would fly to Hong Kong to fight because at least he was Asian, 
right? So it was like, did you not forget all this stuff? Like yeah, I was obviously email. I was obviously qualified enough to train up Asian fighters who could yeah. fight in Hong Kong when you didn't have any, right? Mm. So, but then the rest of my blog post, I was talking about how he had done this to Tamong Fun, how he had done it to Sifu Cheng Jun Fun, and he had done it to many, many other people far more senior than me. You know, suddenly uh, they leave his association, which look, it happens. If you have an association for a long time, yeah, sometimes your top guys leave, you have a disagreement, they go and do their own thing, whatever, right? Um, but you don't have to go out of your way to disqualify them because then what he doesn't realize is that he destroys his own ranking system. If every single high-ranking person who left or was kicked out of your association suddenly is a know-nothing, suddenly is a didn't really earn their rank, Damn. then what does that say about ranking in your system? Damn, dude. Right? <laughs> if someone could be a grandmaster or, let's say, a very high-ranking master in your association... And then that person leaves and you go, oh, they don't know anything. Well, why did you give them that rank? <laughs> All right. Like he doesn't realize he's, he's literally destroying and devaluing his own ranking system by doing that. So I had this epic long blog post. People loved it. It got so many views. And occasionally people ask me, hey, where is that thing? And oh. I'll tell you, when we updated the website, uh, the cfilexrictor.com, it accidentally got deleted. Hey, uh, and it's not on Facebook no, it's anymore. Good. No, no, it wasn't on Facebook. It was on my my website. Right. Facebook had the link to the yeah, the, the yeah. link. So I sp had a lot of photos. It, Damn, it literally dude. went. Poof. Uh -huh. But you know what? It had something. I think at the end, like sixty to seventy thousand views, and it even got translated into German. Someone, someone volunteered went out of their way. to translate it in German, Sat and it got down. all translated in German. Wow. So that the, the German practitioners could also kind of read and, and see these things. So the German um, translation is still out there. No, no. I had the German translation on the website. Someone literally mm. sent it to me. So I had both of them on my website. Unfortunately, it kind of went poof. So it, but it was okay because after it, it was on there for about you a know year. Where it year. Is. No, it's gone. It's in the cloud. It's no, it's nowhere. It's gone. It's poof. All right. <laughs> after about a year, year and a half, it served its purpose. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually kind of glad it's gone. Because uh, let's move forward, man. Who cares, right? So that's the whole war thing. All right. Mm -hmm. And then he never said anything about that. And then the addendum to that story, that happened in 2016. And he, <laughs> he ended up looking kind of silly after that whole thing. Because, uh, uh, you know, a number of Sifus also kind of vouched for me in Hong Kong. And they kind of, he, he looked very silly. And a year later, I was at a big party for Wan Kam Leung in Hong Kong with Antonio. Yes. Yes. And Siva Lerngting was in a table. Is this table the one next same, to not with Johnny Gill? This no, no, no. Johnny this Gill is in Hong Kong. This right, is in Hong Kong. Right. And so he was sitting in the table next to me, and he saw me and just just turned his head and looked <laughs> oh, the other way the man. whole time, just pretended I didn't exist, oh, right? Man. So um so that that was that was the end of that. Damn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I All know right. he still loves you though. Uh, doubtful. He doesn't really love anyone. Oh, no, right. right. oh, if, if, if you saw how he talks to the people who he's closest to, mm. you'd realize I don't really think he loves anyone. All right, next. All right, moving right along. Thank you, G Bucks. G Bucks. Next up, GBUK. My G. My G. Next up, we got awesome Bruce Wayne. Awesome. From DC Comic. I'd like to hear more stories about anyone you met that really impressed you with their skill, speed, or power. Not Lung Ting. Was there anyone in particular who had a really powerful punch or kick? Have you done Chi Sao with anyone that really impressed you? Triad stories are always entertaining. I would also love an entire episode on your top five or top ten martial arts films. Thank you. For the great content. Awesome. Thank you, Mr. Wayne. Uh, yeah, so, well, for the Kung Fu movie thing. You yeah. know, he's Batman, just so you. Hey, you're not supposed to say oh, that. Oh, wait, my bad. Spoiler. My bad. Take, oh, it easy, Take it easy, man. Take it easy. All right? My bad. Yeah. My bad. So, I. I this info just it, in, in terms the of the Kung Fu movie stuff, I don't know how much of the Kung Fu movie stuff I'm going to do because all those episodes seem to kind of tank. Any Anytime I talk about Kung Fu movies, it's like. <laughs> it's like a th we get a third of the views. Mm. The Vincent Lin, Bobby Samuels, even the Ninja one. For some reason, maybe it's because it's not my. It's it's not what people come to my channel. Maybe for. they want the commentary. Yeah, maybe, maybe. I could do something for the Patreon Let's supporters see. or do something like that. But but for the normal podcast episodes, man, those things get a third of the views of the normal episodes, right? Mm. And and the problem is, in, in like you know, it's not like I make a living from doing YouTube, but I would like my YouTube channel to like make more than eighty cents a month. You know what I mean? 
And so the problem is when you have a video that just does really poorly, mm -hmm. your next video is already starting at a deficit. Because mm. YouTube is very... We didn't like your last video. I'm not so sure the next one's going to do good either. Unforgiving. Right? So they're very yeah. unforgiving, right? When you're on a roll, like a bunch of our AMAs, where each one was getting more and more and more views, mm. and then like the Vincent Lynn episode came out, and then the next AMA that came out after that, which was a really good one, was like... So that's the problem. So like anytime Ooh. I do a, a movie one, all right, or Hong Kong action star, mm. that video tanks, and it like my next three videos, uh, my next three episodes after it's that, like a all rebuilding. Suffer. Yeah, I got to rebuild again before it comes back up. So maybe um, what an algorithm, you know, for the uh, for the the second year of uh, Kung Fu Genius, I think we're gonna have the the you know the long form podcast episodes. Yeah, but I also want to do shorter video content, like five to 10 minute videos on different topics, reaction videos, stuff that's not the full podcast format. Mm -hmm. And then so maybe for those videos, I can do some of that stuff. But in the podcast format, it's just crickets every time I do something like that, right? So, all right, so the other question was anyone who had really impressed me? Yeah. Yeah, lots of people. As I mentioned before, I think Sifu uh, Li Tinloi from uh, Southern Mantis, one of the strongest, one of the most powerful martial Chinese martial art practitioners I'd ever met. He impresses the the hell out of me. Uh, Mak Sifu's skill and knowledge impresses me quite a bit. Uh, in terms of Chi Sao, I mean, like, yeah, I mean, a lot of the guys that I've learned from are very impressive. Like, I, I don't know. The question always seems like, you know, uh, who's the one guy who's like can just obliterate you and then say his names because I'm you know like that's the guy or whatever right and, <laughs> that's and guy so I want to learn it's, from uh, yeah it's 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 kind of a weird question because uh, most of the people you learn from should should be able to impress you with their skill otherwise why you're learning from them of course at some point if someone is really old they can still teach you even if they're not physically impressive anymore um, I. Pfft, yeah, I mean, there are lots of guys out there who are really good. The question is, can this person teach you? Mm -hmm. All right? Because they, there can be someone who's extremely skillful and extremely powerful, and um, they couldn't explain math to an accountant. You know what I mean? And, and so, so, what, uh, so then what is the relative value of yeah. that, that person's skill, right? So I think it's, it's, they're interesting questions because everyone, it's always the old West who's the fastest gunslinger. Mm. But when you start doing, mar when you've been doing martial arts as long as I have, it's just like, who can make you better? That's really all you care about. And that, that's mm. not always necessarily the guy with, with the fastest gun. All right. Mm. It's, it's the person who can offer some insight and, and do something with the experience they've accumulated. Right. But Siva Lee Tinloy is definitely one, one of the most impressive in, in, in my How opinion. How so? His power. He's just so powerful. Mm. Yeah. And no nonsense. Yeah. Solid. Yeah. And like very non-imposing kind of person. If you saw him walking on the street, you would not, you would not think this yeah. person was this, the badass that he is. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's dope. Cool. I gotta meet this. Yeah, maybe on a future trip to Hong Kong when they learn when they let us dirty <laughs> foreigners in. Everyone's like, "Yo, when are you coming to Hong Kong?" It's like, did you? Yeah, we're so. Dirty. No one can go to yeah. Hong Kong now. What are you talking about? No, right? No, no one. Ain't happening. All right. They take it personally. Like, oh, how come you haven't been to Hong Kong in a while? It's like, if you notice, there's a pandemic and Hong Kong doesn't let any foreigners in. Like, mm. I'm a foreigner. <laughs> Love Casey being a foreigner. Know. Yeah, Casey I'm, didn't know. I'm not because I'm English. That's oh, right. yeah, yeah. No, no you are now. They booted you guys out a few years ago. <laughs> oh. they, they was that, 97? 97. <laughs> All right, let's go. Next question. All right, next up, we got Harold Tan. Harold Tan. Harold Tan or awesome. Tan. Okay. All right. Tan's how. All right. Hello, sir. Absolutely loving the content. I would like to ask if you have had any experiences, exchanges with non Yip Man lineages out there. What were they like and how have they shaped your views on WC now? Thanks. Uh, I think the, the lineage I've had the most exposure to that's outside of the Yip Man family is probably... Jim Rosalando. Yeah, I was about Chuck. to. Yeah, yeah. I did uh, did a session with him out in Boston where he showed me their drills and everything, and then he also taught here at our 15 year anniversary. I remember. So uh, yeah, so you had, I've, so I've I've had a chance to exchange with him a little bit and, and compare notes. Very very early on in my Wing Chun career, bef even before I did WT, I did Chi Sao with some Yun Kei San Wing Chun guys out in Washington State. Okay. Well, uh, it was in 
it was when I was living in Washington State, but it actually happened in Canada. And that was interesting, but I was also very green at that yeah, time. So I don't that was know, your like, early days. I don't know how much I would. I mean, it, 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 it didn't. Uh, and this is no knock on Yoon Kaesan Wing Chun, but I, it, it, I was 18. It didn't blow my socks off, but I was also an aggressive prick when I was 18 years old. So, uh, you know, maybe if I could go back now, I would have had the chance to see something and learn something. But I was kind of a dick back then. Uh, right. So uh, that is about it. Um, and, yeah, it's important to have kind of an open view about what other people are doing and to kind of uh, uh, see if there are things outside of our wheelhouse, outside of our box that can improve us. But I also think sometimes that's also a little bit of a trap because no matter how good you are at something, you're always going to feel, yeah, there are things that can be better. Uh, there are things you can do better. There are things that you can improve. You should feel that way. If you don't feel that way, you're probably full of yourself, right? Ouch. And the problem is a lot of times people think that that little bit of dissatisfaction you feel with uh, your current level of skill or your speed or whatever is because uh, you're not doing something totally different. Hmm. So people are still always looking for a quick fix. And sometimes they think that quick fix is in another lineage. All right, Not realizing that people from that lineage who've put in all the time and all the sweat equity and are really good at that lineage probably still have some things where they're like, mm, could be a little better at this, not so sure about this. Hmm. Because you always have these things. If you are a analytical person who trains martial arts in an honest way. If you think you have all the answers, if you think you, what you do is perfect, then you, you're probab you probably have a lack of exposure to things, to the real world, I should say. All right. So the problem is that everyone thinks like, oh, okay, if there's a limitation in my Wing Chun's because I need to learn that other Wing Chun style, instead of how about you just maybe start pressure testing what you're learning and you figure out a way to modify it better for your body type or you figure out a new way of using it or not thinking that, okay, I need to now learn completely new forms, a new stance, a new way of holding my arm in this position, a totally different way of training chi sao, as if somehow that's going to actually make you better at what you learned before instead of you just starting again from the beginning at something new. <laughs> and, and now you're going to have to go through all of that only at the end to find out that you're still going to have doubts when you finish that style. Damn. Right? And so that's the trap I think people have when it comes to thinking that all the secrets uh, are in other lineages. I'm very open about that kind of stuff, but I also think there are people out there who are like lineage and certificate collectors. Mm. And it almost seems like they, the more they seek in the different lineages and the more certificates they collect, uh, the less sure they are about anything. Damn. Right? The answer is what you mm -hmm. haven't learned and I, yet. And I don't mean that they're less sure in that scientific way. All right. Like they always say like all the, like uh, uh, there's a, a saying that I like, which is like, uh, dumb people are full of confidence, but smart people are full of doubt. All right. So I'm not talking about that. All right. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying like they, they learn this lineage and they think that that's going to solve all their problems only to find out. Ugh, but that lineage has these things that I don't know about. Let me go over there and do that Damn. only to find out that lineage doesn't have this, but the other one has that. And then it's almost just like switching, trying to find a Netflix program on Netflix. <laughs> Technique when you just collector. don't know what the hell you're watching. Damn. Right? And then there's a very unserious way of studying something and learning its intrinsic value as opposed to just, let me just copy this style superficially and hope that it solves my problems. Oh, it didn't. Let me go copy another style superficially and hope that solves my problems, right? So I find that they kind of end up chasing their own tail when they do too much of that. Mm. Damn. All right, next question. I love sweat equity. Sweat equity. Sweat I like that, too. I like that. I like that, I like that phrase. Whoever came up with that is dope. Yes. All right. Axel Stone. Axel Stone. Is Axel enough. Stone is in the building. Man, how about getting Stallone on the show? What would be pretty? Oh, that would be pretty awesome. I know he's big time, but you never know. I wanted to clarify which Stallone's we get. Is he talking yeah. about Frank Stallone? Frank Stallone. Or maybe Sybil Stallone. <laughs> uh, we might be able to get Frank Stallone. Frank Stallone, yeah. is, Frank Stallone. is... I think the Kung Fu Genius is at the level to get Frank Stallone. I hear oh. he's at Times Square pretty often. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. He's, <laughs> he, he's in the Mickey Mouse suit, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, well, look. All right? Port Authority, chilling. I'm just the pretty face of the Kung Fu Genius. Yeah. You guys are the producers and the people who put everything together. Mm -hmm. So if we want to get Stallone, Frank, I yeah. assume. Yeah. 
Uh, <laughs> that's on you guys, I right? Know, I know. Yeah, I know. yeah. We'll just have. I'm working on something. Yeah. We'll see. We'll just we'll have see our peeps call it. his peeps, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. He, so I can. Ima- yeah. Can you imagine calling Sylvester Stallone's agent? And being like, <laughs> we want you to be on the Kung Fu Genius, but the Kung Fu what? The Kung Fu Genius podcast. Where are you guys uh, on YouTube? Oh, you have five thousand uh, subscribers. <laughs> yeah, let's get them on there right away. Hey, hey, why right? you want me you on the show? What? No joke. You would be surprised. I have an ex-girlfriend who has a podcast. I am surprised you have an ex-girlfriend. <laughs> hey! <laughs> well, she actually, um, shameless plug. I wish I could tell the name of it, but she oh. actually has a podcast where um, about. She Sailor had Moon. Stallone on. No, she did not have Stallone on. But Sela- Sailor Moon fans. Oh. And like. She's, you know, a few subscribers, probably no more than, maybe a few more than us. She gets, like, legit pop stars come on to discuss their, their, uh, like, experience with loving Sailor Moon. Mm. You know who Sailor Moon is, right? Yes, yes. You know what I mean? So yes. it's like... I have a few costumes at home. Uh, well, me too, actually. I yeah. need to borrow yours. No, anyway. <laughs> you won't fit in mine, let's be honest. <laughs> but, like, seriously, I mean, if we had, there was uh, enough of a star that could you could actually argue, say, legitimately was into Kung Fu, uh-huh. right. I don't think it's beyond the realms of possibility. Yeah, yeah, but we have, to, but it's not Sylvester Stallone. Maybe we should get more. Maybe, Sylvester maybe Sylvester Dolph Lundgren. Maybe yes. more, Morton Downey Jr. I mean, Robert Downey Jr. I was going to say, who's Morton Downey Jr.? <laughs> Morton Down, first of all, Morton Downey Jr. is dead. Oh, damn. All right? <laughs> nice. Robert Downey Jr., yeah. <laughs> maybe someone who trimmed Robert Downey Jr.'s hedges yeah, once, maybe. Yeah, once. All right, yeah. next question. Oh, man. Damn. Good luck. Good luck with that, man. Yeah, we'll, we'll get right to it. All right. <laughs> Hey, Kung Fu Genius listeners, if you're a Wing Chun practitioner, especially from the WT or Leung Ting line, and want to get really personalized immersion training with me, you can now apply to do an immersion course with me here in NYC, or if you like the sun, in my Florida home near Orlando. These courses are for instructors or anyone who's serious about learning the art in detail and working hard. I teach in program blocks like Siunam Tao, Chum Q, Buji, Wooden Dummy, and those include the Chi Sao Theory, Fighting Applications, and Training Methods as well. If you're really serious about learning Wing Chun, check out the link in the description below to find out about applying for a spot. For those of you who are not quite ready to do full private immersion training, you can also apply for a spot at either our winter or summer intensive training camps. We have a few spots available for non-city Wing Chun students, so apply today. A link for those options are in the description below. And now back to me. (laughs) <laughs> All right, next up we got JP Steve's Han 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 Han. I remember this guy commented last night. He was he 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 had written in the comments how to properly pronounce his name. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Steve's Han Han Han. There you go. Maybe. I'm Maybe sure that's, that's exactly what it's supposed to be. <laughs> All right. KFG. Another question for your next Q&A session. What's your opinion on Michael J. White commenting that he could beat Bruce Lee? And do you think the public backlash he received was justified? Uh, <clears throat> so, face with that one. so <laughs> first of all, this Michael J. White stuff, this is, this is old news. This old, is super old news, right? like talking three ab- years, right? Talking about it's like talking about my war with Siva Lang Ting at the it's, top it's, of the episode, right? Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's talk about topical stuff. Let's go back to 2016. I mean, this is what people so love. So the, the Michael J. White thing was very ill-advised. Size matters. Yeah. But it was very ill-advised, all mm. right? Because, um... First of all, it just it's it came off really kind of macho-y and bullshit on his part. Well, you know, actually, I'm much bigger and blah, blah, blah. and I, maybe maybe all of that is true. Okay, I think, no, I, I okay, like he, answer he, was so fast. And, yeah, and, uh, yeah, but it's like you know, well, I'm bigger and you know, his size and all this stuff. And maybe mm-hmm. all of that is true. But did he expect to to win friends? People go, like, oh yeah, well, it actually is true. Isn't that great? <laughs> like our beloved. <laughs> Icon of martial arts. Yeah, Michael Jai White, you know, he, he could definitely probably beat him. Yeah, that makes sense. That's very logical. I'm okay with that. All right? Look, people are going to react emotionally to this stuff. All right? You know what I mean? Like, they asked Michael Jai White, all right, do you think you could have beaten Bruce Lee? All right? Some 50 years after Bruce Lee's death. All right? 50 years from now, there's going to be some up-and-coming martial arts action star. Mm. And they're going to be like, so, do you think you could have beaten Michael Jai White? And he's going to go, Michael Jai who? <laughs> but in 50 years from now, yeah. they'll still ask about Bruce Lee. Damn, dude. So that's what I got to say about that. Damn. Ill-advised, all right? You, look, whenever you're like, yo, I could totally have... Whenever you talk about hypothetical beatdowns, 
with people who are either dead or gone or no longer in their prime. Like, yeah, I could have beaten Muhammad Ali back in the, or I could have beaten Bruce Lee, or yeah, I could have beaten Benny the Jet or Keita. It's like, on, on, on what, in what situation, Dre, mm. do you ever come off looking cool after saying that? Mm. Like, what dude is like, you know, you're there, you're surrounded by a bunch of fans and friends or whatever, and you're like, you know, if Muhammad Ali was in his prime and he was in front of me right now, I'd be able to beat the hell out of him. Like, even if you were like a big, like even if Brock Lesnar or someone said something like that, right? Yeah. But wh when does someone who talks that way ever give the impression to other people that they're cool? Never. All right? It's always like the, yeah, I can totally beat up that dude kind of guy, even if it's true. The guy who can beat up another dude shouldn't talk that way. Maybe to an 18-year-old. Yeah, but as a grown-ass man. <laughs> you, you ever sometimes meet some grown-ass men who missed a couple steps of development along the way, and they still talk in that way, and you're like, whoa, you're yeah. older than me, and you're, you're like, you're on a 16-year-old yeah, status yeah, here, right? You're out there on the edge. So, so at, at what, like... At when do you ever come off sounding cool or right when you say, like, oh, yeah, I totally could beat up that dude. Totally. To be fair, I could probably beat up Bruce Lee. But now you could, definitely. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. post-1973. Yeah, he's not no much problem. right now. Got it covered. Covered. Easy. All right. <laughs> you got it figured out. Yeah. Yeah. All right, next question. Got the game plan. All right, next up, got my man, my guy. My guy? La Douche. Guy La Douche. Okay. Hopefully, I got that right. Guy La Douche. Uh, Guy La Douche. It, <laughs> it doesn't it matter. Spelch. Let's not even go there. L E D U C. Now you see. Okay. okay. Question. Please talk about Chu Shang Tin lineage. That's what? not a question. That's like a. You, that's like say something. Yeah, I always love to say some <laughs> shit. Say some shit. Hey, Kung Fu genius, talk <laughs> some shit. Say some shit. Here's the mic. These are good. These yeah. are good too. These yeah. get in there in, in the fold somehow. Uh, I don't know much to say. I mean, I mean I, I'm not an expert in Choi Shang Tin's lineage. So why? Choi Shang Tin. Very early period student of Grandmaster Yip Man mm -hmm. from Restaurant Workers Union. Yeah. Uh, the, the King of Siunam Tao was his uh, was his title. All right? Oh, I remember this guy. Um, yeah, yeah. And um, had a Can't deny that. Had a nickname from Sifu Yip Man. Uh, Sifu Yip Man called him Dai Ming Sing. Um, Dai Ming Sing. Yeah, the big. Uh, the big celebrity. Mm. Um, oh, word! That yeah. was that. That's what that means. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, and it's like almost yeah, like so, I mean, he was one of the guys who was around from the very early days, mm. and uh, um, obviously very senior student of of Sifu Yipman. Uh, at one point, he even traveled to Germany with Sifu Langting. Sifu Langting brought him as a guest over there, and uh, yeah, he's got lots of followers, especially in Australia via, via Jim Fong, who was one of Choi Chung Tin's students who taught in Australia. Very professional. I think uh, Jim, Jim Fong, unfortunately, uh, uh, all passed away even before his Sifu Choi Shang Tin did. And, but Jim Fong, uh, somehow, he, he, uh, he taught in Australia. And he was able to get state accreditation for his schools, like as an educational institution. So like if, he, if, if you got like an instructor's diploma, I think, in Jim Fong's Wing Chun school, that was like the equivalent of some kind of a physical education diploma or something like that. Like he was able to make it like that legit. And he had a number of schools in, in, in Australia, very professional, so like really uh, quite remarkable work. So um, Chai Shang Tin's lineage was very strong in Australia through, through Jim Fong and his students. Mm. Um, and I don't know how big it is in Hong Kong nowadays, um, but uh, yeah, there are some Chai Shang Tin people throughout the world. I don't know that much about, like I, 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 I I have some stories told to me from other students of Grammar Street, man. I don't really feel at liberty to, to talk about. Not, and I'm not saying because they're negative. I'm just saying, like, uh, uh, I just want to be careful about saying stories that other people told me because I didn't get the permission to tell those stories. Uh. And I want to be very respectful. And I'm not saying, and those are not bad things. And it's not like, it's not like I heard bad things about them. It's just that they're stories and these are concerning people who passed away. So, you know, we just want to be a little careful about those things. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, Chai Swing Team uh, was a very well respected student of. Uh, grammar sheet man mm -hmm. dope all right next up we got a couple people asking the same question so i basically merged it all right? merged it merged you the combine question. their questions yeah. like voltron yeah that's how we gotta do it man <laughs> gotta you know cut corners love the episode crazy yip man stories is the episode he's talking about right 
Do we have a crazy Yip Man Stories episode? Something like that. We, we, we talked we, about yeah. Yip Man Stories in an episode, but I don't think that was the whole episode. That was the, yeah, right. but, Keep up the great work, guys. I love that. I love that. You got it. You got it. Question for KFG. What is... Oh, by the way, it's Shadow Mancer 101 and Luis Cruz. Okay. All right. What is the infamous JCVD story? Oh, Jesus Christ. Was it in Siwa or another Cha Chan Ting? Big love from HK. And then Luis Cruz asked, please tell the Jean-Claude Van Damme story. I have not heard it in any of your previous episodes or previous videos, bro. They've nailed us down to tell the Jean-Claude Van Damme story. Uh, coming out of the traps early. You know oh, I mean? man. After wow. the emotional roller coaster that was my war with Siva Langting in this episode, now I gotta relive this. Well, this is a special I mean, story. This is two people. Two people. Two people. Well, this is a special story yeah. because you are part of this story as I, well. How? What do you mean, how? You I know mean, you're part of this I story. Mean, you're the funniest part of this story. No, no. <laughs> Excuse me. We can do a reenactment, all right? So, okay. Um, and uh, Shadow Mancer asked if it was at Choiwa. Remember Choiwa? We went to eat at Choiwa a few that times. That was the right? restaurant. Yeah, which is a Cha Chan Tang. Cha Chan Tang is basically the, mean, it means like a diner, all right, where they have both kind of Western and Chinese style food. Uh, but no, it was not a Cha Chan Tang where we saw uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme. It was actually, if you remember, it was a seafood restaurant where we went to, right, which was in Jim Sa Choi. Well, that, so, okay. So that's kind of a funny story, all right? It's a funny story, and it's also not a great story it's, at the same time. Not, yeah, it, it, well. It's a funny, and, and it's a disappointing story, all right? So, okay, so like many people who grew up in the 80s, yes, all right? So for yes. some of our newer fans, which I don't think we have any, like younger fans, I should say, yeah. um, they might not get it if you didn't grow up in that time period. And, yeah, if, they was, grew, and if they're older, they might have missed the Van Damme yeah, train, all right? So, but if you were in that pocket yeah. where you were like... Um, an impressionable boy in the 80s. Yeah, I was like five or six by the yeah. time the 80s hit. Right. When Van Damme came around, yeah. Van Damme was a big deal. Van Damme kicks, was a big man. deal. It's the kicks, I remember the Bloodsport, when yeah. it came out, it was like, it was everyone was talking about Bloodsport. And we would go to the video store. You remember the video stores back in the days? They would have like, in the release, they would have 20 copies of that thing there because they were flying out. <laughs> Every time I went there, oh, all 20 of them were gone. Out. Yeah. They were already rented. Right. And my dad would take me there like every day because was, there was one by where we used to go. And I'm like, I would go, <laughs> is Bloodsport in? Nope. Bloodsport's not in. Maybe it comes in tomorrow. Right? Next day, mm, like Bloodsport wasn't in. I was like, ah, mm. right? And it was like, I remember weeks and weeks and weeks. And then Bloodsport finally came in, right? Mm. And I just go home, have VHS, looking at the VHS tapes, there's Bloodsport on it, right? And you put it in there and <laughs> watch it. And Bloodsport just... When you were like, so with Bloodsport came out, what, 87, 88, something like that, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm like 10 years old, 11 yeah. years old. Very impressionable. Dude, dude. All right. At the that movie. Most that level. movie. All right. Like, mm. when you're 10, 11 years old and you watch Bloodsport, that's it, right? That's like yeah. the Holy Grail. You just want blood. You just want blood. Yeah. The fight, everything's yeah. great. Like the whole underground tournament, it's like perfect for that market, right? <laughs> that 10 year old market, it's the perfect movie, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so I watched that movie and I was like, oh, it's amazing. The kickboxer came out, Cyborg, and like, oh, Van Damme is awesome, right? Mm -hmm. So been a fan since very early on. And then, you know, fast forward to recent years, I follow Van Damme on Instagram. Yeah. He's very fan, fan friendly. So he always posts like, he's got like, his, on Instagram, he'll have like his fan of the day. And, you know, he likes, he'll be in the airport and some fan will come up to him and he always... He always goes out of his way to take photos with fans. Oh, that's sweet. And I knew this. That's so sweet. Before we ran into him. <laughs> I knew because I was already following him on Instagram when we when we were in Hong Kong. That was I, what, I didn't know about that. That was 2018 when we went to Hong Kong. Yes. All right. So I was already following him on Instagram and I knew that he was a very fan friendly celebrity. I also knew that he also lives in Hong Kong. So from what I understand, he basically splits his time between LA and Hong Kong, but he fell in love with Hong Kong when he shot Bloodsport. Mm -hmm. So he's got a place there. I think uh, there in Tim Ta Choi. I'm not going like, right. to... I, no, I know, I know the building where he lives. I'm not going to give that away. Like but right upstairs or something, right? Some, he, well, of course, upstairs. He's not downstairs. He's Van <laughs> no, Damme, no. right? He's not in the basement of some seafood shop. So, <laughs> but anyway, he lives like in a, kind of a nice spot over there, right? Mm -hmm. So... Uh, 
you know, I always thought in the back of my mind, because I go to Hong Kong one to two times a year, at least in pre-pandemic times, that the likelihood, because of my circle of friends and the fact that he lives there, that we oh, would yeah, run into... a few people that, that you know, Yeah, too. that we would yeah. run into Van Damme. The likelihood was kind of high. Like, it was just a matter of time. It's uh-huh. statistics, right? So, we, we it was our first night in Hong Kong. Or first or second night? It's about the second. Second night, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So, you guys were still adjusting at the time, and I brought you guys to... Uh, the 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 Kowloon side pier, Jim yeah. Sajo, right? This was the so, same night we saw Fifty Cent. That's right. So so we were there. You see, we saw the the you know the at nighttime. I you know I did the touristy thing with you guys. It's your first time in Hong Kong. Like, yeah. The skyline at night is very impressive. So Dope. They have all the places there that take the photos. You know, in front of the skyline, and then we saw one of those vendors that had a photo of Fifty Cent, <laughs> which was amazing <laughs> because the lady working there. Clearly had no idea no that 50 clue. Cent was a famous rapper no because clue. she had the photos of all these like Western couples yeah. that got photos. And 50 Cent was like at the bottom. Yeah. So for her, it was like just some random black yeah. dude who got a photo. And, that, we, were looking, and we were looking and through we were like, and we're like, yo, dude. What? 50, 50 Cent. cent. <laughs> it's 50 Cent. What? And he was just like there in the corner. like, yo, yeah. 50 Cent. It was so crazy. We just thought that was the funniest thing, right? And 50, so cent, 50 cent did the touristy photo thing. Yeah. And he was also by himself. He yeah. didn't have a crew. It's like he's yeah. just hanging out by himself, right? He, he definitely pranked it out with that mm-hmm. one, I think. I think he probably told her, put mine in the bottom. Yeah, yeah I don't yeah. know. But anyway, right. that was kind of the beginning of what would become kind of a silly night, yeah. right? So then after that, we're like, hey, you're a little hungry. Let's go get something to eat. Mm. So I knew... This great restaurant there in the Jim Sa Choi area, seafood restaurant. I've eaten there before. Um, and so I'm like, yeah, let's go to this spot over here, right? So we start walking up towards that spot. Mm-hmm. And as we approach Antonio, he goes, hey, Sifu, isn't that Jean-Claude Van Damme over there, right? <laughs> right. And we peep Antonio's Jean-Claude Van Damme. On first. Antonio's on first. And we peep Jean-Claude Van Damme in front of the restaurant mm-hmm. having a conversation with someone. Yeah. Okay? We can't really say... What, what kind of someone? Hey, 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 just hey, a someone. Hey, 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 hey. I'm going to try to tell this story in as diplomatic a way as I can. All right? This is a someone. I don't it want any beef with anyone. No. All right? We don't need to go into any, hey, any don't descriptions. Even, don't even keep talking about that right now. All right? You need to stop talking about that right now. No description okay? needed. Jean-Claude Van Damme was outside the restaurant having a conversation with someone. Yeah. We'll leave it at that. Okay? okay. Does it... <laughs> <laughs> What's the, right there. He okay. Had a different type of demeanor, though. When we okay. There. Okay. Let me tell. It might the, have been an argument. Hey, let me tell the story because I don't trust <laughs> your ability to say things in a somewhat diplomatic way. All right. Damn. So I was like, and in that moment, I turned into a ten-year-old fan. Yeah. Like, oh my God! It's Jean-Claude Van Damme. I need to say something. He's a fan-friendly celebrity. When are we going to have... The, and plus, I was there with you, and Arnell yeah, was there. Arnell was with me. We were kind of <clears throat> in the back. We didn't yeah. even know what all was of our happening. Bo- all of our we boys were, were there. So bringing we're like, in the rear. We were still bringing in the rear. We didn't yeah. even know. So I'm like, this so, is perfect. Yeah. We're all here. Yeah. Okay? So I decide I'm going to go up to him and say something. Uh-huh. And then, you ever, you ever say something weird, and you realize... That that's the first time those words have ever come out of your mouth in that order in your entire life. Put zero thought into like, it. Like, well, not even that, but just like sometimes you realize in, in your entire life's experience, yeah. you've never said certain words in a certain order. Even though you may have said all of those words at some point in your life, but in, in, in that exact order, those words have never come out of your mouth. And the moment they come out of your mouth, you realize that. You go like, geez, I've never said that before, and it feels awkward. Oh, I had no. one of those moments right yeah. then and there. Oh, no. I walk up behind him. I don't tap him on the shoulder because I don't want to, like, freak him out or anything. Like uh. that. And I say these words that have never come out of my mouth in this order in my entire life what, what and not words? since. I go, excuse me, Mr. Van Damme. <laughs> <laughs> Which, like, the moment it came out, I realized, I have never said, excuse me, Mr. Van Damme, before ever in my life, right? Oh, no. And he turned around, Mm -hmm. and one could only describe his state as inebriated. All right. I'll leave it at that. No, not... He looked at me, I should say, he looked through me (laughs) and around me. As if he was having a hard time focusing on me. Oh, man. And he waited for a moment as he focused. Of course, the whole time I'm looking at him, he's standing right in front of me, like closer than I am to you right now. None of that six feet distance. Yeah. And I was, and I, and the first thing I remarked is, well, he's not 
as big as I thought he would be. Oh. That was the first thing I remarked because he, you remember, like, you know, the muscles from Brussels. Yeah, yeah. I just imagine him like stouter. He's like five, seven and a half. You know what? He's not that tall not and, and five, he's not that six. big. I remember seeing him just going, like, well, he's, he's not like this physically imposing oh. dude I thought he would be, right? All right? Not at all, which was shocking, right? Yeah. And while all of this is going through my head, he's like trying to focus on me. Uh. And he just looks at me and he says, maybe next time. And turns around and proceeds to have his conversation with uh, whoever he was talking to before, right? And I was was gutted. Because it was like, he's fan friendly. I knew that. This was my one shot. And that was it. And so I I was like, oh, man. I was so dejected. So we we walk into the restaurant with our tails between our legs. And I text one of my friends who knows Van Damme personally. Yeah. Okay. And this friend of mine says, uh, I'll give him a call and tell him who you are. And mm-hmm. in my mind, I'm like, that's right. Yeah. You tell him who I am. Yeah, because you tell him that that was the Kung Fu genius and <laughs> yeah. he just blew off yeah, outside yeah. there in the in, uh, outside of the restaurant, right? You let him know that wasn't just a normal fanboy, bro. <laughs> no, no. That's the Kung Fu genius, nah, he bro. He needs to get on it. All right. You he need to get to on it. that shit, right? <laughs> that guy's going to have 5,000 subscribers yeah. on YouTube one day, right? Right, right. right. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so, anyway. Uh, we go back into the restaurant. Mr. Van Dam goes back into the restaurant, sitting a little further away from us. Oh, no. Yeah. And I after I had this. texted my friend. I remember this part. I can hear Van Dam's phone ringing. <laughs> so I know my friend is trying to call him. But he's not answering. And Van Dam's not answering. He's just like, nah. <laughs> it just keeps ringing. <laughs> <laughs> just, nah. Not this guy. Boom. Yeah. Yeah. And he doesn't answer, right? <clears throat> and then uh, I... Uh, get a text back from my friend he says uh, he's not answering his phone i'm like yeah, yeah I, we, I know. Can, we, we can kind of know we're, we're here we're, we, we see what's going on and uh he asked me oh who is the person that he's with and so i described that person yeah and to a uh, no yeah, like, just enough just and, enough. and then that, that and then i'm just gonna leave that at that all right and then so we felt kind of dejected mm-hmm. and perhaps a little bit Cold sn- snubbed by yeah, Van Damme. a little snubbery. So we pulled out the phone and made a video, <laughs> which I post that video like once a month on my IG. <laughs> I always say things like, never forget. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it's yes. you and me in that restaurant. Mm-hmm. And you're making an observation. The video, so you're looking around, you're looking at Van Damme yeah. and you go, Van Damme is at the restaurant. Uh-huh. Oh, and the no. video pans to me, and uh. I say, and he's high as f***. <laughs> and you go on and laugh so loud that every Chinese person in that restaurant just right. turned their head Even like, Van Damme kind of was like, what the hell is that? <laughs> what the hell is that laugh? And so Van Damme's not in the video. He's off camera. Yeah, yeah. But that video for me is one of the funniest because oh. it encapsulates what happened that night. Oh. If you follow me at the Kung Fu Genius, or if you follow my personal you post Instagram, it like seven times, yeah, once a month I'll put it. I'll, I'll, I'll and I'll post it. Never forget. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, that no. is unfortunately my Van Damme oh, story. Oh man, classic moment in in time. Yes, in KFG time. KFG time. Oh man, All thank right. you, thank you for that. Absolutely, thank you for that experience. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I, and I, I, in hindsight, I wouldn't have wanted to experience that with anyone else. That was a perfect storm. Because, you know, and maybe the story doesn't come off quite as funny when I tell it on the podcast. Mm. But that was, when we were there, <sighs> shit was hysterical. Oh, was and, so I, and that was such a great story. Like, oh. if you're if Van Damme is ever going to blow you off, yeah. that was the perfect way. It was just <laughs> funny. It was just great. It was awesome. Yeah. I loved it. Woo. Right. And then we saw him on the way out, too. He was pretty nice on the way out. He was, like, right in front of us. I'm under the and impression he had completely forgotten about <laughs> his previous encounter with us right, by right. the time we left. Right, right, right. Yeah. He, he probably had no idea. <laughs> yeah. Pretty funny. Yeah. Pretty fun night. Uh, next up, we got Quan. All right. All right. Quan, okay, okay, okay. What's uh, a Dreisen question? Isn't Dreisen the one that's supposed to ask Dreisen yeah, questions? This is a Dreisen question, he says. <coughs> uh, maybe right. he knows Dreisen personally. Uh, or maybe he is Dreisen. It's just his I, other account. We have to figure out who Dreisen is, we, man. This, we, to this, is, this has I've, to happen in season two. I've got a pretty good idea <laughs> who Dreisen is. Yeah, you got a pretty good idea? I, yeah. I still have the, the slightest clue. 
<laughs> you have the slightest clue. I mean, that dude who <laughs> But you know what? Honestly, here. that's all you really need is yeah, the slightest <laughs> clue. <laughs> you don't need much more than that. Yeah. yeah. The slightest clue could sometimes be spot on. All right. A Dreisen question. Hypothetically speaking, you are walking. He's talking about you. You are walking into your school. Okay. City Wing Chun. All right. That is your school. Yep. When you enter the school, all of your all of a sudden you are transported to a mysterious room. You look around and you see a calendar and it says the year 1964. Okay. You also see a book on a table that says Jun Fan Gong Fu. Uh-huh. You cautiously walk further and peek around another room. You see a young Bruce Lee and his entourage and a young Wang Jackman. Oh, here we go. And his crew, surprisingly. Uh -huh. You know what's about to happen. Also, you happen to have your cell phone with you. Oh, here we go. What do you do next? Oh, I'm filming that shit. <laughs> I'm filming that yeah. shit. Yeah. I'm going to spend all my time showing it to some people. Uh-huh. But I will never release it. No? Someone's got to pay for that. Oh. Oh, yeah. I'm selling that. Oh. Yeah. I'm selling the most comical fight you've ever seen, <laughs> which is Wong Jack Man running away from Bruce Lee and yeah. then tripping. Oh. All right? Mm. Damn. No, I'm definitely filming that. Yeah? Yeah, I guarantee you, if you could watch that fight on video, it was, it was a hot would dumpster like, fire. Ah. No, it's a hot... It's not, it's not Bruce Lee at the ah. end of Enter the Dragon. <clears throat> All right? It's Wong Jack Man running away and trying to stay away from his chain punches. Mm. And then it's... It's a guy who wants to beat the other guy up and another guy who doesn't want to be there. Okay. All right? And this is not, not an epic duel or anything by any stretch of the imagination. Some people might <coughs> beg to differ. In yeah. In the comments, maybe. Yeah. Except that David Chin, who was in Wong Jack Man's entourage, he was one of his boys, he admitted that Bruce Lee beat Wong Jack Man. That was Wong Jack Man's boy. So the, the, whole, the, the whole thing, it, it's over. All right? <laughs> they don't need to contest There's this no anymore. They don't need to contest They don't need to contest this anymore. <laughs> All right. Oh, uh, sorry, guys. Okay. You can have your own opinions, but you can't have your own facts. Ow. Ouch. All right. So next up, moving right along. Uh, thank you, Kwan. Or maybe Dryzen. Next up, we got RM Puig. The Wooden Dummy online tutorial was super cool. Awesome. It helped to clear up some questions I had on the choreography of the form. I do have a question for your next KFG episode. All right. There are some WT instructors that put instructors that put a lot of emphasis on the push pull aspect of the form. I know that the push pull in in some movements in your opinion are they going a little overboard with that aspect of the form, or do they have a valid point? Uh, well, a lot of the movements in the wooden dummy form and a lot of movements in Wing Chun in general have a bit of a push-pull aspect to them, especially, obviously, controlling movements. Mm -hmm. um, it's part of the nature of how a lot of things in, in Wing Chun work, as well as other Chinese martial arts. Uh, yeah, I mean, what you often find in Chinese martial arts is people have their, they have their little pet... Um, ideas and their pet concepts, mm. things that they like. And these could be things that are present in the Wing Chun system, but they like it so much it becomes, it starts to take over. They do it everywhere, you know? Uh, and, and so that person's interpretation is highly influenced by this one idea, which might be uh, a simple idea or a minor idea, but that person has made it a major idea within their own interpretation. Mm -hmm. um, definitely, there's a lot of push. There are a lot of push pull aspects in different movements, especially uh, the cow um, sao talk sao setup and things like that in, in the uh, in the form and stuff. But truthfully, I don't really know what a lot of other WT people are teaching in terms of the forms. All okay. right, because I learned the wooden dummy form directly from Sifu Lang Teng, mm -hmm. and I learned it from Sifu Carson Lau. And then I got corrections from Sifu Elman Leung, all right? And then later, my Sibak Timi Lee showed me how he does it, right? So all of my instructors on the wooden dummy were all Chinese instructors, and Sifu Leung Teng 
was the one who taught me the wooden dummy. So, allegedly. Yeah, allegedly. In one week, right? Uh, I learned everything so quickly, right? right? Man, I wish it would only take me one week. I would have saved so much money. So much money. I would have saved so much money. More money than switching to Geico. So, <laughs> no. uh, so I don't know what, like, some random... There are lots of WTC foods out there. Lots of guys in Europe. Lots of guys... I don't know what any of those guys teach. Because uh, maybe I come off as a bit of a snob, but, like, I learned from Sifu Langting and from Carson Lau and Elman Lang. In, in Timmy Lee, and I've also done with some other high-level masters from Europe. Like, they've shown me what they do. But uh, I what seeing XYZ in Tennessee teaches, like, I, I'm, uh, pardon me when I don't, like, totally get excited and pay attention to that, right? You know what I mean? Sifu XYZ. Exactly, right? Name. So uh, Sifu XYZ <laughs> sounds, like, sounds like a DJ name. <laughs> XYZ. Yeah, so uh, so I don't know. I mean, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know really who is teaching what as far as that stuff goes. I just mm. know what my instructors have taught me. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, push pull. All right, do we have one more? Yeah. Okay, we do. All right, yeah. what do you got? We got Mo Howard. Mo Howard. Yeah, from the Three Stooges. Yeah, God, he's I up I was, in the mix. Like I was dead. Oh man, he's he made it in. Uh huh. Have you heard about the fight between Bruce Lee and Travador Ramos? Uh huh. Allegedly, Ramos is the only man to ever defeat Bruce. Yeah. Oh yeah. His story reads like Frank Deuce story. Like a Frank Deuce story. Dukes. Dukes. Yeah. Not Dukes. Did you say Deuce? Deuce. Frank Deuce. Deuce. <laughs> sounds like a lazy pronunciation. That sounds like your rap name, Frank Deuce. <laughs> Frank Deuce. <laughs> <laughs> Frank Deuce from the Deuce. Yes. Yes. From Deuce 42nd does it. Street. Yes. Yeah. 40 Deuce. Just wondering if you heard about it and if you have what your thoughts were. Um, yeah. So, I mean, they're all of these kind of, pardon my friend, those are these bullshit stories, all right? So this Travador Ramos guy, some, I don't know, he'd be some martial artist, karate guy or whatever, uh, who supposedly showed up on the set of Enter the Dragon and, and beat Bruce Lee up, okay? So if I just tell you that story without giving you any other facts, what do you think of that story? Uh, do you think in all of the stories we've ever heard about what happened on the set of Enter the Dragon. Mm -hmm. That some guy named Travador Ramos showing up and beating up Bruce Lee in the middle of shooting that movie mm -hmm. would somehow escape the collective consciousness of everyone who was there and mm -hmm. the only place you hear this story is from Travador Ramos. Yeah, there's got to be at least, you know, someone telling it at least one person, because there's a yeah, lot there is of one people person. On His set. name is Travador Ramos. All right, <laughs> but the thing is that if this guy showed up on the set of Enter the Dragon and beat up Bruce Lee, <laughs> the only guy to defeat Bruce Lee. Uh -huh. All right. Yeah. Who who else saw it? Mm. Do you know how many people were on the set of that movie? How many? Lots. You saw that movie, Enter the Dragon. Lots. Look, all those extras. Yeah. All the stuntmen. All the crew. But they all wanted to keep it a secret, I'm thinking. Oh, they all wanted to keep a secret that Bruce Lee got... No one wanted... Maybe Travador he, said to keep it a secret. Yeah, yeah. To he, save face. To, to everyone. Yeah, exactly. Because you know how good people are at keeping secrets. All right? You know how you know how good people are at that, right? <laughs> Especially stuntmen. Yeah, you know what? They, they did... Um, they did... I, I read something <coughs> about uh, conspiracy theories. Yeah. On some of the I big... I love conspiracy on theories. On some of the biggest conspiracy theories. Because the problem with huge conspiracies behind government things or whatever is the number of people who would have to keep it a secret for this thing to work and this is like literally impossible for humans to do and they said the most well orchestrated conspiracy based on on you know statistics meta statistics how humans behave would never last more than 4 years before the before the jig was up because people cannot People cannot keep secrets like that. Like, f on the most organized conspiracy, like, government conspiracy, it would last four years, mm. on average, before someone just just spilled the beans yeah. on it, right? Okay? Uh, so, we're, men we're meant to believe that some, that some lone martial arts guy showed up on the set of a movie he which he was not on. He wasn't even part of the on. set. Yeah. Okay, he wasn't even part and of the And in movie. front of extras, actors, How whatever, he get in? beat up Bruce Lee. And no one... <laughs> saw this. How'd you get in, Travador? Yeah. All right. Honey, how'd it's you also get like in? The, there's that phony who, uh, you know, Bruce would do that demonstration at, at uh, uh, tournaments where, you know, you had to hold your hand up there and he would go and kind of flick you. You had to block it or whatever. Yeah. One of those guys, like, he couldn't stop Bruce's 
uh, uh, from tapping him or whatever. And then uh, later he said he defeated Bruce Lee in an actual fight. Okay. And it's like, you're the guy who couldn't stop his punch there. <laughs> and he's literally saying, like, at that moment, that's when he defeated Bruce Lee. Like, just delusional ass people. Yeah. Delusional ass people. Oh, man. All right. Yeah, I mean, think about it. Look, it's not that Bruce Lee was un- unbeatable or that maybe someone, maybe especially in his early days, had not beat up Bruce Lee or something like that. But this idea that at peak of Bruce Lee's fame in Enter the Dragon, someone shows up and beats up Bruce Lee in front of a bunch of other people and no one says anything about this except the person who's claiming the story. I'm sorry. Get the fuck <laughs> out of here. All right? And that's all I got to say about that. All right, well, I hope you liked that episode of the Kung Fu Genius. As always, don't forget to write in the comments below any questions you have for a future episode. Like the video and subscribe to the Kung Fu Genius and hit that bell for notifications. And as always, I'll see you guys next time. Word is I'm a Kung Fu Genius. Technique speaks for me, not lineage. Forget Jet Li, cause I'm the one. Many call me Sifu, but to you I'm Si Kung. And I produce masters. You surpassed us. Your Kung Fu stiffer than corpse and caskets. City Wing Chung is the house I built. Violate the gate and your blood gets spilled. Alex Richter, always the victor. As always, don't forget to write comments below. Like the video, don't su- <laughs> <laughs> Don't subscribe. Don't subscribe. <laughs> I was going to say, don't forget. Don't subscribe. Dude. Oh, f- all you guys. Don't, don't hit the. F- don't smash all the you subscribe guys. button. Yeah, don't hit. Don't follow us. No, we don't want that yeah, shit. We don't want you. We don't need you. I'm kind of, s- I'm kinda sick right now, all right? Take it easy on me, all right? Oh, kind of. Oh, he's kind of sick. This is the first time I'm hearing about this, like Travador Ramos. I'm going to murder <laughs> you, Trey. Someday. I'm Someday. going to use my fists and murder you. <laughs> you heard no, it here first, no weapons. <laughs> no weapons. No implements. <laughs> I'm going to murder you with my fists. Yes. Slowly. Best way. All right, everyone. Well, I hope you like that. Is this on? This doesn't sound on. No, I literally cannot hear myself in here. All right. Are you sure though? <laughs> Stop. As always, don't forget to write your questions below for future episodes. Like this video and don't forget to say, what the f*** did you just do? <laughs> he did. He hit the thing and blew it on me. He because, hit. because you laughed at it. I would have played it off. No one would have given a shit. Andrew could have taken that little sound out. <laughs> sound will forever echo. <laughs> That's the best sound ever. All right, everyone. Well, I hope you liked that episode of the Kung Fu Genius. <laughs> you laughed on that one. You get get out. Get I out. Didn't laugh. I get was out. Smiling. Get out. I was smiling at the, the at the fans. Ah. All right, peeps. <laughs> what the <laughs> f- was that? Not- what was that? What a, what a dick. <laughs> <laughs> the genius will be answering all sorts of hot and nigga nuns. You're gonna you're gonna get that dad joke. You know, Dre, I'm very sad right now. I had to break up with my girlfriend who's cross eyed. We just couldn't see eye to eye. And you know what? I was pretty sure she was seeing someone on the side. (laughs) (laughs) How long did you keep that in the pocket? That was a good one. one. That was a good one to pull out the pocket. Yo, Van Damme is at the restaurant. And he's high as (laughs) fuck.